Good morning. I have a uh, special guest today. Her name is Tamara Zoner. Tamara is a life coach and founder of a company called The Life You Love Now. She uh, focuses on the whole idea of happiness, so I'm looking forward to uh, exploring that with her. Tamara had the uh, guts to start her business or at least go formal with her business during COVID, which is probably not an easy thing to do. But initially, she started the company back in January of 2014. I, I would say more of a uh, freelance side hustle type thing that's evolved into a more formal business. So Tamara, thanks for uh, being with me today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So Tamara, we're going to talk about happiness today. Before we dive into happiness, talk to me about what you were doing back in 2014. Why did you create this company? It was kind of a side business at the time. And why did you decide to go full bore in, uh, in, in 2020? In the middle of COVID, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in 2014, I had really just gotten my life coaching certification and something called a passion test facilitator certification. And I was in this place of rediscovery. I was deeply unhappy and could remember being very happy and was trying to find my way back to me. And so in 2014, I ended up leaving my marriage of 15 years and moving my kids and I back home, home where I'm from in Michigan, from our home in the UK, mm. and really just had to start fresh. And, and so being a single mom with a new coaching business, I needed some steady income as well. So I got into senior living by synchronicity and the beautiful thing there was that I, I learned all the skills I really needed to run the business side of my business. I can get on a stage and light up a room and tell people about happiness or purpose, but I didn't know how the business side ran and working full-time helped me do that after being a mom full-time for 10 years. Yeah. And so after about four years with the company I was with in 2020, I started to feel out of integrity. And for me, that's a guiding force in my life. And I, I feel it very strongly in my body. Am I walking my talk or am I shifted, shifting to the side a little bit? And so when COVID hit, it, it hit senior living quite hard. And in fact, my community was the first one in Michigan to have a positive COVID case. Mm -hmm. And I was exposed that very first week and ended up being home for three weeks. And had that time to really reflect on what I wanted and what was needed. And I'd known for a while, you know, my business had been calling me, get back out there, focus on it, you know, bigger work to do. And when I came back to work, I started teaching my seniors as they came out of total isolation for three months, the skills of happiness. Yep. And it made such a massive impact on them that I thought, what am I doing here in this one building when I can be doing this in many buildings and online and around the world, thanks to technology. And so I, I did some deep meditation for guidance on the when and exactly how and what, and it showed up. And in October of 2020, I left senior living and started my business full time, full throttle. What's a what's a typical client for you right now, Tamara? Right now, it's typically someone in some form of transition who is, again, trying to find their way back to what really matters so that they can find their spark in life. They're either they're divorced or they're an empty nester or they're new to the area and they're kind of going, I don't quite know what to do. I don't quite know what I want. And so we start with the passion test, which is like a GPS for your life. Yep. You figure out the five things that matter the most to you. And then I teach you how to align your life with those things. Yep. And it's a lot of freshly divorced and probably they're attracted to me because that's my story, right? Like I was freshly divorced, finding my way. And these tools got me from kind of misery to being one of the happiest people I know. <laughs> right, right. So how, how does the relationship typically work when you when you take on an engagement? Is it, is it a matter of weeks, months, longer? Uh, how, does yeah. that, how does that whole thing work? If I'm working with groups or in a corporate setting, it's a day, maybe four days, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, an individual. Usually we, I ask them to commit to six months because it's within that six month container that real 
lasting habits can be formed because what we're doing is really creating new neural pathways. We're teaching new habits and people need support and accountability to make them last. Right, right, right. You know, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile before you dialed in. I checked it out before, but I checked it out just uh, a few minutes before we we uh, logged on. And I was looking at your career and it looks like you've done a number of different things. You, you've been involved in health and wellness. You've worked in the with, with seniors. You've also, you're a writer. You've done work uh, that supports children. And then here you are today with, you know, offering this, this uh, happiness coaching offering to, to pretty much anybody. But I'm wondering, was your career kind of a, uh, was, was each step in that career kind of leading you in this direction? It's almost like you were looking to touch different types of people at different parts of life. And somehow you got to this place. Was that an intentional thing or an accident? I mean, that was different divine accident, right? <laughs> I fully believe that everything in our lives prepares us for what we're truly meant to do. And, you know, a lot of that was me moving around because I married a French guy right out of university and, and we immediately moved to Singapore. And so there, you know, it's like, okay, what can I do here? So I worked for the American Women's Association and I also taught Japanese men English as a second language. And then we moved back to the States and to Grand Rapids with young children. So I was like, okay, what can I do now? I still want to feel like I am doing something in the world. Raising children is the most important job there is. And I like to do more. And so I started figuring out how could I incorporate my kids into my life. So I taught kinder music and then we moved to England and I thought, okay, here I am starting over again. So what can I do here? And so I started writing primarily about parenting and, and, and that's where I got into coaching as well, because I was, I was, um, I was unhappy in the marriage at that point, pretty darn unhappy. And and I was taking it out on my kids and I was yelling at them and I was like, okay, this isn't cool. I've done enough personal development work. I mean, you know, my university degree was in family studies and psychology anyway. So I, I knew enough and I'm really real with myself. So I was calling myself on my own BS. Yeah. And, and so I started seeking ways to stop yelling at my kids. And at that same time, I was going through my passion test certification. And one of the things that I learned that made a profound impact was what you put your attention on grows stronger in your life. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was putting my attention on yelling instead of on speaking lovingly. And when I made that shift, everything changed and we're eight years later and my kids don't remember that version of their mom, <laughs> the angry yelling one. And so it all kind of led me here. And then back in the States after leaving the marriage, going into senior living and just realizing that I'm living on purpose. I'm living my passion when I'm helping others see their light or find their light. And it doesn't really matter what I'm doing. What matters is how I'm being and how I'm showing up in the world. And so, you know, even though I wasn't doing what I thought I wanted to do in my business full time yet, it was all leading me to have the stage presence, the skills, the organization skills. I was a director of life enrichment. So I had to run, create, plan events and all of it led to what I'm doing now, which is workshops and trainings, and then getting in front of corporations to help them see what their employees really need. And I'm teaching to seniors too, because honestly, the stuff, this, the habits of happiness and the way that we think about happiness, we start kind of going down in happiness really young, like senior, yep. like in high school, right? Yep. So from kids to 90 year olds, I've worked with a 96 year old. We all need it. We all need a reminder and we all need the skills because happiness really is a skill. It's not just something that happens to us. Right. Do you think, you know, it becomes a, unhappiness becomes a habit 
it, it sounds to me, you know, you're right. You know, at that point in your life, you're very, you're incredibly vulnerable. You're, you're about to graduate high school, for example, supposed to go to college and then somehow make a decision that's going to put you on the path, uh, you know, for the rest of your life, which rarely happens that, that, that seamlessly. Yeah. But you, you talked about divorce and you talked about being unhappy at work. And th those are, th those are two things that I wonder how many people are in the, in a similar situation to you, you know, how, how long into the marriage did it take for you to realize that you're not happy? You know, you, you, it may have just been an unhappy day or an unhappy week. And all of a sudden, you know, months go by or maybe years go by yeah. and you probably felt like trapped in that. And the same thing with the job where, you know, I, I remember as a, as an employee of different companies over the years, I had some, I had some jobs I absolutely loved and then I had some jobs that I hated and I could never quite figure out why. And there were so many days or weekends where I would sit there and complain to my wife about my job and it, the money was fine. The, mm -hmm. the titles were fine. The responsibilities were fine. Uh, even at times the people were fine, but I just didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to do something else and I couldn't figure it out. And it occupied so much time and, and, I, and I'm trying to bring this full circle, but people that are unhappy at work, which is a lot, tend to be imprisoned by, by money or what they think they need for money. Right. And they think leaving is not an option or leaving that title is not an option. I've got kids, I've got responsibilities, and yeah. they create this false narrative that they can't change. It's just too risky. And then, they, and then all of a sudden they're dead. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they never made yeah. a, a damn change. So you know, what, what was your, what was your experience as it relates to those things similar to what I'm describing or? Yeah. I mean, I can't say that I've ever really hated a job. I'm, I am a naturally optimistic person and I have a, a what we call in, in the happiness business, a, a naturally high set point most likely. Yeah. And, and I'm a relentless optimist and that's, that was my gauge in the marriage, right? Going, Oh, this is not, no matter what I do, nothing, this doesn't change. And it was not a defeatist attitude because I really did. I gave every effort, every effort, but some people are unmovable <laughs> yep. and my ex is one of those. And so, uh, you know, we think we're stuck. So it's not our situation that we're stuck in. It's our yep. thinking that we're stuck in right. and until we make a shift there and recognize that we're always at choice. Like I was telling, I am teaching a high school class actually right now. And I was telling them, look, you think you have to come to school. You think you have to do your homework. You think you have to have this job to earn the money to go to college. You think you have to do this. Really, you're making choices every day. We all have to pay our taxes, but really we don't. We don't have to do anything. We have to deal with the consequences of our choices, yep. good or bad. Consequences can be good too, right? If I go to work and I get a paycheck and I can feed my kids, that's a good consequence. Yeah. If I don't and I get fired, well, we consider that a negative consequence. And so it's really our thinking that gets us feeling stuck, but we never really are because there are, if we're willing to open our minds to opportunity, then we can see more. But if we're closed, you know, with those blinders on, then all we see is exactly what's in front of us. We have to be willing and courageous enough to look around and see what else yeah don't you have to be willing and, and courageous enough to own the fact that we do have a choice so when so the choice means you have responsibility in it and yes. and yes the outcome or the consequences might not be what you want but when you accept the responsibility for your choices you can you can tolerate or deal with the outcomes i would think or the consequences so is it, is it, is it that people are trapped by unhappiness because they, they're just used to blaming the circumstance or other people? Absolutely. Because if you, if I, if I take responsibility for my situation, a lot of people equate responsibility with blame, but it's not the same thing, right? I can blame the weather for a thunderbolt that strikes down the tree, yeah. but I take responsibility for cleaning that up, right? There's a difference between blame and responsibility. And we think that they're the same. 
a lot of the times. And so there's this fabulous YouTube video um, called, it's something like corporate, two corporate people stuck on an elevator. And it's the first thing I show a class when I'm teaching the foundations of happiness because responsibility, taking responsibility for your happiness is the first foundation. Yeah. And they're going up this escalator and the escalator stops. And there's this very dramatic, like crashy sound as it comes to a halt. And they stand there and they look at each other and they're like, what? Oh no, this is terrible. You know, how, what are we going to do now? And they, like the, the video is about two minutes long, really just bringing home this, oh, and then finally they shout for help when all they had to do was walk up the stairs. Right? It's really poignant and very funny and sad. Right. But this yeah. is what a lot of us do. We could do something to yeah. change our circumstance and we don't. We're just like, oh no, this is the way it is. It's I'm I'm stuck. I just have to deal with it. You ever run into people that they're always stuck in their in their relationship with other people is just sharing about, hey, here, here's the latest and greatest problem of in my life, or here, here's another reason why this one let me down, or let me tell you another reason why I got screwed over. And they're always the <laughs> they're always center stage, you know, look what's happening to me. And they surround themselves with people that are, they can't wait to hear the next story. What else happened to you? Right. Oh, there are so many people like that. And yeah. it's really because we're conditioned, we're conditioned in this negativity, right? We see negativity on the news. We see negativity everywhere and our brains are wired for negativity so that we pay attention to dangers. So yeah. we register a negative in a split second, but it takes 20 seconds or more for our brains to register a positive and be able to actually create a new or strengthen a neural pathway toward the positive. So it's, I mean, it's almost as if the odds are against us. And so people have to really want the change. I will go and speak to a group and anybody can come. But if I'm gonna take someone one-on-one, -on -one, it's because they want to do the work. I'm not dragging anybody kicking and screaming. They've made a decision that they're uncomfortable enough to yep. make the changes necessary to feel good in their lives. So happiness, I would think, means different things to different people. But as you look at your clients and the people that you've worked with over the years, what would you say, what are the top reasons why the average person is not happy? They're thinking. <laughs> it really, the number one reason in, in my perspective is they're thinking because they're in this habitual pattern of thinking negatively. Mm -hmm the whole life could stay exactly the same. But if we're able to train our brains to see the good that's actually already around us, mm -hmm. then life becomes easier and happier. So it really is thinking number one. Mm -hmm. And then of course, sometimes we're in circumstances that are unpleasant, but it's only through a shift in our thinking that we can change them and believe that we're first of all worth it. Yep. And second of all, capable of it. What do you think they dwell on though? Thinking absolutely, the negativity can creep into anything. You know, some people I hear constantly dwell on their weight or they'll constantly dwell on their job or they'll constantly dwell on what they don't have. You know, I don't, my house isn't as big as your house or my kids are driving me crazy. Do you find that there's any theme to the unhappiness? Are there, are there, are there areas of life that that negative thinking focuses on more so with some than others? You know, what I think is true for most of the people who are unhappy is that they are lacking a deep connection with themselves. And that is why I start with what I start with. Like, let's look at what really matters to you, because are you is that present in your life? And if it's not, this is the problem. Like mm -hmm. if you're just doing all the things you've been told or you think that you're supposed to, life feels pretty miserable. We have, we are meant to love life. In my opinion, that is, I don't think we're put here to be miserable, you know, slaves to our existence. We are meant to find our fire and enjoy life. But if we're stuck in that, oh, I just have to, I have to, I have to, I'm stuck with this. Life feels pretty darn miserable. Yeah. And so, and people disconnect from themselves because they're just numbing out. They don't, they don't want to feel the misery, but in order to change your circumstance, you have to wake back up. Right right? You have to go, right. oh, and you have to connect with yourself and you have to have a willingness to feel what you're feeling. Yeah. 
so that you can recognize what will move you back toward feeling good. What are, what are people not thinking about when they enter into a relationship or a job or whatever, friendships, that maybe they should be thinking about before just casually entering in? I, we definitely need to know ourselves, right? We need to know who we are and what we like about people and what we like about ourselves and what we like about environments. And we need to know that the common factor that's always present is us, mm -hmm. right? So I can go to five different jobs and say, oh, none of them were any good, but really it's probably in part due to me. Like I, there's something that I'm not dealing with or looking at. Yep. And same thing, we show up in the same kinds of relationships over and over and over because we haven't gone to look within and see, what am I settling for? Do I, you know, a lot of people don't have confidence, like insecurity, low self-esteem is, is a pandemic that has been here long before COVID and will probably be here long after. Mm -hmm. And if we don't feel confident in creating and keeping healthy boundaries with other people, then we'll feel like we're always being walked all over. Oh, everyone walks all over me. You let them, <laughs> you show them how to treat you. We show people how to treat our, us by the way that we treat ourselves. So a lot of the work is teaching people to recognize what their boundaries are and then practice keeping them and sharing them and saying, hey, <laughs> and learning how to say no to others so that you can say yes to yourself. And that doesn't mean not being a good human helping and being of service because that all matters and it feels good too. But it means that when, you know, the analogy of, of the cup, right? My cup is half empty or my cup is half full, but this applies to us too. Do I serve from the cup so that I just keep pouring it out to others? Or do I fill my cup up and keep it full so that I'm serving from the overflow? Right, right. So you said the number one thing is the negative thinking. I would think that the negative thinking is directly tied to how you how you treat yourself. How, how do you care for yourself? Because if you don't, that's going to have a direct impact on the quality of your thinking, what you think, what you choose to pay attention to. Yeah. So can you talk about that a little bit and how much self-care ties into the quality or the nature of your thinking? I think it's so vital. I actually did a video on this last week because <laughs> I got a little fired up about somebody who wasn't getting up and, and giving themselves some self-care and self-care to me is the thing that needs to be the priority on your calendar and everything else fits around it. Yeah. Because if we're caring for our body, we're also caring for our mind and we need exercise. We need movement. We need healthy food to fuel us. We need to really pay attention to what we're nourishing ourselves with inside and out. And that includes news and television and our forms of entertainment because it's all getting into our brain. Every single thing is being registered by our brain, even if we're not consciously aware of it. And so self-care is not just a spa day <laughs> or a nap, right? right. right? right. It's, it's choosing to do what's good for you, even if you don't feel like it. I, I'm a firm believer in self-care. I, I, I don't look the greatest and I'm aging like crazy and all that. But We're all aging. That's but, so good. <laughs> yeah, right. So it is what it is, but I can't not get a, get a good night's sleep. I can't not exercise at some level. I can't not eat well most of the time. I can't not read, mainly because I know when I deviate from those things, and this has been years and years and years of being committed to this. Yes. If I don't do those things, I don't feel good. I'm not, I'm not on my game. I will literally pull back from people on, if I go a stretch of a few days of not eating right, not, not getting enough sleep, I can feel myself pull away because I don't feel, I'm not on my game. So I know yeah. that's my medicine, but I've had people say to me, I've had people offended by that. You know, mm -hmm. like, look, I'm, I, I eat what I want and it's not all about the way you look. And, and it isn't, it isn't about the way you look, but I find it interesting that 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 sometimes that's the direction their head goes is I don't have to fit into that pair of pants or I don't have to look this way. It's no, you don't. But but did you ever think for a second that maybe your mind would be thinking differently if you fed if you fed your body differently or you moved a little bit differently? Yeah, exactly. It's not about how you look. It's about how you feel. Right. And 
whatever it is that you want to feel, whether it is feeling like you fit in that favorite pair of pants or whether you have energy to play with your kids throughout the day or do the work that you feel like you're meant to do in the world, it matters that you have behaviors that support it. And people are like, oh, I'll do it when I'm motivated. But you know, because you've been committed for a long time that the motivation comes after. You have to do the thing, whether it's eating better, getting more sleep, exercise, and then feel the benefits from it. And that motivates you to keep going. So I always tell people like, give it three days and then two weeks and never skip more than two days. Like you have to commit fully for, I, I usually, if they're my client, I say a month, do this every day for a month. And then, and then fine. If you need a day off, whatever I say, I exercise every day. I do yoga every single day, but every day for me is five or six days of the week. Yep. And then there's built-in grace, right? Oh, I woke up late today to get my kids off to school. Yoga is not going to happen. That's okay. Right. And we plan for it and we make that time for it because we feel so good in our bodies and our minds when we're doing these things that we've learned from experience support us. Right. You, you brought up time. I, I love the word time and I hate the word time because that <laughs> seems to be the number one excuse that anybody has for not doing anything is I just don't have time or I, 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 I can't make time for that. And in the meantime, they're making time for thoughts that are absolutely, you know, counterproductive. And that's where their time is spent is trying to analyze what's going on up here. How do you deal with that? And do you, and do you have to deal with that with your clients? Um, sometimes yes. I had one client who didn't think he had time. And so I said, well, why not start with five minutes, five minutes. First thing, you know, you're going to hit snooze anyway. So hit snooze and let that snooze time be five minutes of stretching, five minutes of jumping up and down five minutes of pushups, five, just five minutes. You can start with five minutes. Yeah. It doesn't need to be a huge, like, Oh, I'm going to do a 60 minute workout routine every day. Start with five minutes. Yeah. Absolutely. Everybody has five minutes. We all have the same amount of time. So how come some of us can get a lot accomplished and fit in our exercise and some of us can't? You're right. It's because of what we're thinking. Now, what about the people you hang out with? How, how, does, how does that, like, as you, as you think about your own situation and then coming to the conclusion that, hey, my marriage, I've got to move on from this marriage or I have to go start this company. Mm-hmm. How much did the people around you impact your ability to make those decisions and move forward? People around us are a huge factor, right? It doesn't always have to be the case, but we really are influenced by the people we're spending the most time with. They're just like anything else that we're putting into our minds and bodies, right? And so if I'm surrounded by a negative partner, that is going to influence me very heavily. And if I want more positive thinking, I'm gonna have to work twice as hard in that relationship, or if those are the people I'm surrounded with, then if I go and I find some more positive people to hang out with or just start reading more positive uh, information. What I started doing during that time was listening to was kind of the precursor of podcasts, um, just listening to talks by different teachers in spirituality and personal development. And I would listen to that like two or three hours a day. Mm-hmm. And that helped me really start to rewire my thinking so that then when said negative person comes home from work I've got a little bit of a buffer yeah and I and I'm practicing this every day I'm practicing being kinder I'm practicing my meditation my yoga and finding my own center so that my voice gets louder than theirs and then in a work environment yeah if you're surrounded by people who are just like yeah this nine to five is good enough for me but you have dreams of maybe leading that business You've got to hang out with people in some way or another who are where you want to be. So, right? Like if I want my business to be a six-figure business, then I need to know that it's possible by by witnessing other people and seeing that, oh, they did it. They're in my field. They've done it. And then hanging around them so that I can learn from them and be pulled upwards. But if I'm hanging out with, you know, really cool people who work at a fast food joint, I'm not going to be inspired toward that 
next level in my business. I'll be like, oh yeah, let's just sit around and play video games and eat French fries. That's cool. <laughs> that's not what I want. If that's what you want, more power to you. Can positivity have a negative impact on people? I love that question. And I will say only if it's inauthentic, that toxic positivity where we're, we're ignoring reality and just covering it up with cotton candy and fluffiness. Yeah. That is not good. That is not that is not authentic. What I want people to learn is authentic positivity. And that means that if I have had a bad experience, maybe I've lost someone or my car breaks down, I get to have all those feelings too. I don't just gloss over and go, oh, well, I'm sure there's a good reason for this. I'm sure there is, but I still get to feel ticked off, frustrated, angry, or if I lose someone I love, grief, Yep. All the feelings that are part of our human experience, we're meant to feel. And it's positivity can be a bad thing when they're covered up and ignored. I say, if you ignore it, you store it. And if you feel it, you heal it. Like feelings are meant to be felt because that way they're released. But if we're just like bad things happen, shove it down, ignore it, that stores in our body and shows up as dis ease later. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I like the fact that you explained that because I was watching a uh, a kid's basketball game recently and overheard one of the young kids on the bench make a comment about a coach. And I, I'm not the coach of this team, by the way. And, <laughs> and, 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 and so I overheard this person say, I don't like coach so-and-so. They're way too nice. And, and it was an interesting comment because what the, what the child was saying and and knowing more about the situation is we're not playing well. And all we do is get the cheerleader clapping. You're doing great. And the child was insulted Mm -hmm. that the coach was not holding the team to a higher standard. And I see this in, in business all the time. And I would say that the uh, the, the, the management professional or the leadership professional that teams tend to shut down on the most are the ones that are naively positive or inauthentically positive, as, as you would say. Right. But it makes the person lose credibility with, with those around them. So how would you suggest to somebody who might be, th- there's, a, there's a really cool book called Radical Candor, and, it, and there's a concept in the book called Ruinous Empathy. And I kind of lump that in, into this category. How would you recommend to somebody who defaults to positivity, thinking they're doing good, how would you recommend that they provide, say, constructive feedback or direct feedback that may hurt? Can they possibly do that without, without coming across as naive or cheerleader-esque or whatever you want to call it? I think it is possible. I mean, I think a lot of us do it as parents every day, right? Where we we want to support and encourage. And also there's a reality check. So, you know, I do believe that the little sandwich technique can be helpful. Like, hey, I see that you're working really hard on this and that's great. Can I offer some constructive feedback? You know, and I think that asking permission is really helpful because also it takes a little, like if you are that person who always wants to be the cheerleader and you're seeing that that's not effective as a manager right. then, or a parent that's the same job, right? Yep. Um, then we need to be realistic and we need to be willing to coach our team of employees how to do better. So if I see that my kid is failing at loading the dishwasher <laughs> and I just am like, oh, you're doing such a great job instead of saying, hey, play some Tetris, learn how things go together, (laughs) you know, or like the glasses go here and see how this fits better. Like we have to be willing to use our own skills. So here's why having some sense of confidence in your own abilities is important as a leader. Use your skills to say, Hey, you're doing a decent job. Can I show you how to do it even better? And that way you can totally affirm your people because appreciation matters. That is actually the number one thing people in the workplace want. More than high pay, more than benefits, more than job security, they want appreciation, but not fake. 
<laughs> yeah, well, well, I think especially now, money, money and titles have become such a major focal point over the last year or two, where, you know, you've got a whole population of in, in the workforce who's, who are saying, hey, now's the time to strike. Now's the time to go grab the money. Now's the time to demand the title. So often getting the money and getting the title does nothing to impact happiness or satisfaction, to your point, appreciation, recognition, genuine appreciation, genuine yeah. recognition, yeah. not, not, Hey, great job. And you know, let's, let's have cake right. on Friday. It's a pen for you with our logo. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> How important is self-awareness when delivering feedback or, you know, say for example, I'm not a happy person. And I say, Hey, Tamara, put a smile on your face. What do you, what are you moping around about? How do you not throw it there? How do you not throw that back at me knowing that maybe I'm not living that way? Through self-awareness, right? <laughs> really? That's it. like when we recognize that people are lying to themselves, it's because we are self-aware. The reason I'm a great coach. In fact, at this point in my career is because I've been there. Yeah. And I remember when I was lying to myself. And so I recognize it in others. And I know that it's possible to make that shift to be a self-truth teller. And yeah. it starts with self-awareness, right? Self-care is the sister to self-awareness. But without self-awareness, we don't even need know that we need the self-care or what kind we most need to put our attention on. Yeah. And so that self-awareness is so vital. And, and it's what people see from us as to whether they see us as genuine. And so if I'm coming on here and I'm like swearing through my day and angry, and then I get on here and I'm like, I'm going to teach you happiness, Dave. You're going to see it. The real experience of my life is going to show through because it really, it does. We can tell when people are faking it. We yeah. see it and we lose respect for those people because, because they're not being authentic. And we as human beings really do I believe I am a little bit of a Pollyanna as, as far as I think of human beings I think innately we're all good we all want what's best for one another as individuals and community and when we see someone who's disingenuous it strikes a chord in us and yeah. we feel it we yeah. really feel it so that's why that self-awareness is so important because that way you can feel what's going on around you and what the truth is. And one of the first exercises that I teach people to do, even my high schoolers, is to simply pause a few times a day and notice how you feel. This is how we begin building self-awareness, right? Just pause, do a body scan, notice where you're holding tension in your body, notice the quality of your thoughts, Just maybe three or four times a day for a couple of weeks, see what happens, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And then you start to notice how you're actually behaving because so many of us are just living, like we're sleepwalking. It's like we're, you know, that destination you drive to a hundred times a month, you, you're on autopilot. We move through life on autopilot, but we can interrupt that by checking, <laughs> checking in. How much is our happiness? I know the answer to this, but I'm just asking you to, I want to see where you go with it, but how much, how much does our happiness hinge on our addiction to vices, whatever those vices are? I mean, we, we live in it. We live during a time where if you don't have a vice, if you, if you don't take some sort of medicine or you don't, you know, drink this or smoke that, or, uh, then you're probably the, you're probably not the norm. So it's very normal to have a, a dependence on something today. And maybe, maybe more so than ever in my lifetime, at least that's my observation. I don't have any statistics to back what, up what I'm saying. It's just general observation. How do you help people knowing that there are a tremendous amount of people that are doing a lot to destroy their happiness unknowingly. Well, one of the things that I do is teach them about <laughs> happy for a bad reason. <laughs> right? <laughs> so happiness does have a lot of different definitions and it's a spectrum, right? We're not unhappy or happy all the time. Sometimes we're happy for bad reasons yeah. where we're drinking or we're doing drugs or we're gambling or we've been shopping or we're just watching hours and hours and hours of Netflix. And again, this comes back to self-awareness, right? Yeah. If I decide to veg out and have a couple of glasses of wine while watching Netflix, I want to at least be aware that I am consciously choosing to disconnect. Yep. And then it doesn't become a vice or a yep. bad 
habit that's lasting. It's like, I'm going to just check out for a minute, but I'm aware that I'm doing it. Yes. And I'm aware that I don't do this every night because if I do, then I'm going to develop a problem. Right. So if we're being happy for a bad reason, more often than we're happy for good reasons or happy for no reason, then it's really time to take a good hard look if you want to. And again, I come back to this. Yeah. People have to want to. We can't force anybody to be more conscious, to be more self-aware, to take better care of themselves. But if they want to have a genuinely good life experience, it's necessary. There's so many questions I can keep asking you. Every time you speak, I have another question that comes up. What have I not <laughs> I asked you here? All day. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's interesting. Well, I mean, I would think at some level, and, I, and I, I, I would say it probably applies to me too, that doing this kind of work, the more you discover or the more you probe into these areas, the more you realize this is the answer or here's another answer and it fuels, it fuels you. And, and then the more fueled you are and the more things start to connect on uh, in your life, the more you want to tell other people if they're open, if they're open. Yeah. Yeah. And I genuinely think that this is the way we change the world, right? If I work with a parent who takes responsibility for their own happiness and starts shaping up their behavior, they teach those skills to their kids. And I just want to tell your listeners that if they feel like there's any area in their lives that could feel better, you have the skills within you to at least find the help that you need to make them better. You can't, you can do it. It is totally possible to go from wherever you are right now to wherever you want to be. It's just a habit. That's it. It's just a way of being. And when we take responsibility for ourselves, I don't know if you got this because it froze a little, but we impact everyone else around us, everyone else around us. So this is how I think that we change the world, yeah. right? It's not through massive social justice schemes. It's by one human being taking better care of themselves, being kinder and more compassionate with themselves, and then bringing that out into their experience with other people, and then everybody else doing the same. And it's a big ripple effect that will change the world. You know, it's the only thing I would not the only thing. It's one thing that keeps me sane is knowing that if I want to feel differently or think differently, I can do that without without needing anyone else to give me an answer. But I do see lots and lots of people thinking that the answers are come need to come from some someone else. Someone else has to show us the way someone else has to make things okay. someone else has to give us permission or tell us what to do. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. And, and I, I love the message of the answers are right here. All the tools are right there in front of you. I don't care if you're rich or poor or anything. These things are right here. You can still make small decisions each day to impact your level of happiness, no matter where you come from. For sure. And there are so many free resources available now to anyone in any kind of developed country. Like YouTube has everything you need. I have a free channel on YouTube. You can get so much value from that and never have to hire me. I love (laughs) it when people hire me and (laughs) like it's available, but that's part of that self-awareness piece too, right? You have to be willing to look within. Yeah. And see that you have these resources because sometimes we're scared of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's important to know that it is okay to feel whatever you feel wherever you're at and just start from there. Yeah. Now you got me going again. I want to make, make one more <laughs> comment and I'll stop. I'll stop after this because I know you have to go. The it, It's okay to feel what you feel, but there are people feeling things that they've felt for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, and they haven't let go of anything. They feel it's almost like, no, I have to hold on to that. I have to, that's, that's part of who I am. That's become their identity. And they haven't put it down. They haven't let it go. Maybe they haven't forgiven themselves. Uh, They're still ashamed of something. And uh, it's sad for me when I, when I run into that with people that they still carry every mistake, every judgment, every, God knows what happened to them and they never let it go. That's, that's tough. I mean, you must encounter that as well, I'm sure. And, and any, do you have a comment on that? And then I'll, then I'll leave you alone. Yeah. So then I prescribe <laughs> a practice of self-compassion and forgiveness to start with. Tamara, real quick, before, before I let you go, what's the best way for people to reach you if they want more information or they want to connect with you? Uh, they can 
head to my website, a life you love now.com and connect with me there. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube regularly and LinkedIn, as you know, and it's just Tamara's owner. It's a fairly unique name. So you Google me, you'll find me and I welcome questions, comments, and clients. <laughs> Excellent. Tamara Zona, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Okay.